Hello and welcome to another episode of The Way I See It. Recently I saw something online where someone was like, you know, some online theologian, was saying Jesus, what Jesus did on the cross was not penal substitutionary atonement because forgiveness means that God forgives us without us owing anything to him. So I'm going to go into that a little bit today and talk about what Christ did on the cross for us and, you know, what the purpose of that and what forgiveness is and get all into that. So let's get started. So today we're getting into penal substitutionary atonement, which if you don't know what that is, I will give you a definition as we go along here and discussing forgiveness and what God's forgiveness is, um, what constitutes forgiveness, because there seems to be a lot of, you know, differing opinions on what the purpose of Christ dying on the cross was and what that means for humanity. Remember, the purpose of my channel is to help you deepen and strengthen your biblical worldview. I try to take deep concepts, but I try not to go very deeply into them. As I've said before, you could take like seminary classes on some of these concepts that I just kind of touch on and I just try to give you like a little takeaway to put into your Bible study and your understanding of God and the universe and the Bible and all that. So if, you, if you're interested in more of what I say, you know, it's kind of incumbent upon you to either go to your pastor or go into a Bible study or Google things online and read more about it. But I just want to kind of introduce these ideas to help you kind of clarify what you believe and why you believe it. So the penal substitution teaches basically that we were condemned to die and go to hell for our sins. And so the penalty, like, right? And then substitution means Jesus was substituted in our place. So Jesus suffered the penalty for mankind's sins. And so it derives from the idea that divine forgiveness must satisfy divine justice. That is, God is not willing or able to simply forgive sin without first requiring a satisfaction for it. Now, when we're taught forgiveness, right, we're taught basically that when you forgive someone, you're not requiring that they pay you back in any way, right? You, you can forgive someone who abused you and now they're dead. Like they can't even, they couldn't possibly do anything to repay you because they died, you're forgiving their memory. Or maybe they're still alive and you just don't have any sort of relationship with them, but you're thinking, I have to forgive them in my heart so that I can move on in my life and live my life without anger and grievance, right? I have to be able to move on, so I'm going to forgive. So we're taught that forgiveness means you don't owe me anything. So then people turn around and say, if God is truly going to forgive our sins, he would be able to just forgive them, overlook them. And that therefore the, the death, let's see, what do they think? The death of Christ was, they'll call it Christus Victor, which is also, I believe, a combination of what Jesus was doing on the cross. I believe it was penal substitution, but I also believe Christus Victor has merit. So the Christus Victor model basically says that when Jesus died on the cross, he, he brought victory over the powers which hold mankind in bondage, sin, death, and the devil. So Jesus was dying to defeat those things, but he wasn't dying in our place. So there, there's these two different ideas of what sin is doing and what power sin has and how you're going to get to heaven. And we're all going to get to heaven now because Jesus has broken the power of sin. I kind of believe both of those. I believe that he was doing that. He was breaking bondage of sin, death, and the devil over certain people. <laughs> so this kind of gets me to the third point that I'm going to talk about, which is going to be limited atonement. I'm not going to go much into that because I previously addressed it in a video or a couple of videos, and I'm going to put links. There's one there, and I'll also include links in the description. But um, basically, I believe in limited atonement, which means what Jesus did on the cross was to satisfy God's wrath for the people that God has predestined to be his people. So let's talk about what forgiveness means, because here's my thing. I believe forgiveness means one thing for us, but it means something different for God. And here's why I believe that. So we have scriptures that teach us about forgiveness person to person. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 40, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, which is kind of loosely quoting Exodus 21, 24, 
also Leviticus 24.20 and Deuteronomy 19.21. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. And then Jesus also tells us in that same chapter, Matthew 5, verse 44, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, right, if you're, in, if you're loving someone and praying for them, well, that implies forgiveness. He's not explicitly saying it there. In Romans chapter 12, verses 18 through 20, Paul is saying, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. And that is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, 35. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. So, and that's a loose quote from Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. So here, Paul is saying essentially the same as what Jesus said. Love those who hate you and serve your enemies and love your enemies. Pray for them. Help them. Forgiveness implies that you're not coming to them with your grievances saying, but you've mistreated me and you've done this and you've said that and you owe me and I, I'm not going to be nice to you until you give me an apology. So we're taught to forgive and not expect anything in return. We're taught to overlook the injustice, and it doesn't necessarily mean reconcile, because it may not be safe to reconcile, right? If you were abused by forgiving that person, you don't necessarily say, and now our relationship is restored, and we have a love, you know, that, that may not be the case. You still can set boundaries of saying, I can't associate with this person, because that's not good for me, or other people who depend on me, but forgiveness means you don't owe me now. But why does that mean that for us, but not for God? The reason is because we know that God will repay, right? Just as he said there in Romans 12, slash Deuteronomy 32, 35, God says, it is mine to avenge, I will repay. So forgiveness does not mean the same thing for us as it means for God. We are allowed to overlook someone's wrongs and forgive them. But it's because we know that God will not overlook wrongs. They are punished. Forgiveness does not mean that God overlooks our wrongs and nobody pays the penalty. Because then God would not be righteous. right? He, he's righteous. That's one of his attributes. It's in everything he does. Every command he gives. Every action he takes. Every judgment he passes down is an exemplification of his righteousness, that he is right all the time in everything he does and everything he says, and he doesn't change, and he hasn't changed over time. So what does forgiveness look like on God's end? So in the New Testament, we see in Hebrews 9, verse 22, it says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And that's loosely quoting basically most of Leviticus. I don't know. I mean, multiple laws about sacrifices being brought for forgiveness of sins. So, for example, in Leviticus 5, it's talking about bringing certain animals to sacrifice as a sin offering. And in Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for your souls upon the altar. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. That's kind of more explicitly what Hebrews 9.22 is talking about when it talks about how the law says. So in God's book, forgiveness comes through payment of blood. We see then in Leviticus that the blood is what causes, what brings about the forgiveness of sins. So that's why it makes sense that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was for the forgiveness of sins and why it doesn't make sense then to say that God will just overlook our sin because that's what we do when we forgive. There's two different kinds of forgiveness. The human kind of forgiveness is not the same as the godly kind of forgiveness. And the only reason we can give the human kind of forgiveness is because we know that God will hold everybody to account. So that brings me to the idea of limited atonement. I'm just going to quickly touch on it. And that is to say that Jesus' death on the cross was perfectly efficacious. <laughs> it perfectly 
took perfect effect, fully paid for the sins of everybody who was going to believe in him or everybody who up until that time had believed the promises of the Messiah from God, who, who were of Abraham or maybe had joined the Jewish people by ritual and believed the promises God made to Abraham about the Messiah. And since Jesus, everybody who now believes in Jesus as the Messiah, his blood paid for our sins. His blood did not pay for the sins of every single person ever. And it did not even theoretically pay the sin for the sins of every single person ever. Because as I talked about in my video on the doctrine of election, which you can also watch or scroll down later after this video and click on it then, I laid out the reasons that Reformed theologians believe that only certain people were chosen who are going to be those who believe in Jesus. And they're going to be those for whom Jesus paid the price for their sins with his blood. They're going to be those who are with God in heaven in the end. So what does that mean for everybody else? They don't receive forgiveness. They don't even want forgiveness, basically. If you want forgiveness for your sins, that's a sign that the Holy Spirit is pulling you, drawing you. If you don't, and you're angry at God that he would be so mean to people who are just trying their best, you may not be, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it may not be time yet for you, or it may not be ever time for you. We'll see. You'll see. That's, a, that's between you and God. I don't know. I don't know what the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart, or will do in your heart, or has done in your heart. So I can't make that call, but I do know that there will be people, most people, as Jesus said, the way to eternal life is a narrow way and only a few people find it. The road that leads to destruction is broad and there's a whole bunch of people on it. So we know that Jesus will one day judge. He has said he's going to come back and judge. And that after that, so he's going to divide the people, those who go to eternal life and those who go to eternal destruction, God will punish the wicked. I've read multiple verses on it. They're in all over the Bible. I'll put a few down here at the bottom because I'm not going to read them all over again because I've already read about them in the video about hell and all this other stuff. So the point is, God will punish the wicked. God will condemn the devil and his angels to hell along with the unrepentant. The devil is not going to be in charge in hell. He's not having a great time while everybody else is suffering. He's also going to be suffering in tor torment. And again, there's other places you can go and read about or watch videos about hell and why it's just and why it's not overkill and why would God be so mean. And I think part of the problem that a lot of folks have with it, this idea of eternal torment is that they are thinking of it in this sort of a way that became popular in evangelical churches in the 80s and 90s, frankly. Um, they see it almost cartoonishly violent and... They don't realize that it's really just about, it's really about darkness and destruction. It's about not having any of the common graces of God that we even have on earth. Even if you're an atheist, I believe you experience common grace because you, you experience the sunshine and the warmth of a summer day. You know, you have the love of your family or friends or your pet. You have health, hopefully, right now. So... All of that is common grace that is given to everybody, whether they believe in God or not. But one day in hell, even common grace will be gone. And it'll, it will be because God is righteous and he's just and he is faithful to his word and to do what he has always said he will do. That is part of his love. If he allowed us to continue to coexist with sin and evil for eternity, he wouldn't be ultimately righteous and that wouldn't be ultimately loving. To be ultimately loving is to put an end to death and sin. That's what the purpose of hell is. So I hope that clears up the idea of what penal substitutionary atonement is and why it is what I believe Jesus did for us on the cross and what that means about forgiveness. When we say forgiveness in human terms, that that's different from Bible terms, a, a godly terms. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to leave me a comment on this. Please like this video share this video, and subscribe to my channel, and tell all your friends and family to subscribe. I'm almost to 130. I've been kind of sitting at 128 for like a while. I would love to get to 130. See y'all later.